What's up everybody, Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Today, I wanna to talk about five weird things that Presbyterians believe. That's right, of course, as Presbyterians, uh, we're a little bit unique. Uh, we're a little bit unusual. I get that from time to time. People come into our churches, let's say from a non-denominational or kind of generically evangelical background, maybe from a Baptistic background. And uh, at, fl at first blush, we kind of look like we're normal Christians. And then all of a sudden you start digging in a little bit deeper and you find out that, hey, these Presbyterians, they, they believe a couple of weird things. So I want to address those weirdnesses in this short video. Uh, probably each one of these topics I've already explored in other longer videos, but let me just go ahead and introduce all five of these things today. Before I do that, though, let me just clarify. Hey, we're normal evangelical Protestants. We hold to the Orthodox traditional historical understanding of Christianity. For instance, we believe that the Bible is the word of God. No question about that. We believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. I even have my people stand up when we read the Bible and I remind them every single time that the Bible is God's word. We believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No question about that. We preach the gospel. We tell people to repent of their sins and to be saved just like you do, just like most other, well, all other evangelists evangelicals, right? All faithful Protestants do this. We send out missionaries into the world. Uh, we believe in discipling our members. And of course, we gather together on the Lord's Day for the worship of the one true and living God. So in that sense, we're exactly like, at least I hope, every other Orthodox, faithful, Protestant, evangelical Christian out there. And yet there are at least five things that make us a little bit strange. And let me address those in this video. Hey, if you're new to this channel, what's up? My name is Matthew Everhart. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship Presbyterian Church. Uh, Gospel Fellowship PCA is just north of Pittsburgh in western Pennsylvania. We'd love for you to come visit us sometime in real life. We have worship services at 8.30 and 11 o'clock on the Lord's Day. Well, let me tell you five things that you're going to find out about us soon enough that you may consider a little bit weird, but we consider to be perfectly normal. Here's number one. First of all, we don't have any images of Christ in our sanctuaries or in stained glasses or even in our children's curriculum. Now that may sound very strange to you. You may belong to a church where there's stained glass everywhere and in that stained glass are pictures of Jesus. You may have pictures of Jesus on the walls of your hallway or the the corners of your stairwell. That famous picture of, of Jesus with kind of long hair looks a little surfery. Uh, but if you look around a Presbyterian church, you're probably not going to find images of Christ. And that is because we have a very strict view of the second commandment. So this goes back to the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy chapter 5. We interpret that commandment to forbid any depictions of any of the three persons of the Trinity. And so that would include Jesus. So when you look around our churches, you may not find images of Christ. And when we hand out coloring pages to our children, we don't hand out uh, pages that have kids coloring in pictures of Jesus walking on water or anything like that. It's a very cautious view. I understand it's a little bit abnormal, perhaps, for many evangelical Christians to hold that view, but we believe that's the best way to safeguard uh, the, the divinity and the glory of Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit, so that's not something that we do. However, I will simply say this. Um, if you look back to the Reformed Confessions of Faith, that is those great confessions of faith from the Protestant era, you're going to find that that's actually the majority view amongst all Reformed churches. In fact, it wasn't until about the 700s AD that the medieval church began to incorporate the use of icons and imagery and things like that into their worship. We feel that that's a dangerous trend. We feel that that led towards iconology and the worship of God through the use of icons that is so prevalent in the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox churches that uh, during the Reformation, we said, no, we're not going to go that way. We're not going to have any images of any of the three persons of the Trinity. You can read more about that in the Westminster Confession of Faith. So that's the first thing that's going to be a little bit weird for you if you're an evangelical uh, or non-denominational coming into a Presbyterian church. Second of all, you're going to notice that we baptize our children. Now, hopefully you already knew that about Presbyterians, but the first time you witness a baptism of a child, it might be a little bit strange for you. And I just want to explain to all of my Baptistic friends out there, uh, we love you, we, uh, we, we consider you brothers and sisters in the faith, but we do practice baptism slightly differently than many evangelicals do, especially those influenced by Baptistic tradition. So, 
we have a view that emphasizes the continuity of the Old and the New Testaments. And we would point to, for instance, uh, those uh, those harmonies between circumcision, circumcision and baptism. We would say something like this, that just as the Jews brought their children to be circumcised, that is to put the sign of the faithful covenant, the covenant faithful signs on their children, it was a blood sign, it was a sign of pain, it was a sign indicating that somebody was going to come for the people to bleed for them, in fact, even be cut off for their sake. And so just as they brought their children to be circumcised in the Old Testament, so often, so also we bring our children to be baptized in the New Testament. No longer, though, do we, uh, do we inflict them with the blood sign or the pain sign because all the shedding of blood, all of the suffering has already been done for us in the Messiah, that is Christ Jesus. And so therefore, what we have now is a washing sign, a sign that points towards the grace and the mercies that we have in Jesus Christ. We do not say that the baptism of our children saves our children, but no, we we must actually teach them to repent and to believe in Jesus Christ for their salvation. As far as mode goes, you may also be surprised to know that we sprinkle or we use pouring. Now, if you come from a different church and you've been baptized by immersion, we have no problem with that. We'll accept you into a membership of our churches if you've been baptized in a different way. But you, you might be a little bit surprised, perhaps even caught off guard, when you see us pouring water on a baptismal candidate. And we would point to passages uh, that indicate the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. It's a beautiful sign, uh, a beautiful picture of what God does for us in his mercies. It's abundant. It's plentiful. Uh, it's a beautiful sign of pouring out, and so we use that as one of the modes of baptism. I've got several other videos on baptism that might be instructive for you, but let me move on to the third weirdness, and that is the fact that we sing the Psalms. That's right, we actually sing the Psalms. Now, uh, if you come from a, uh, most evangelical churches, you're probably used to having some sort of like a stage or a platform where there's a performance, maybe even looks like a little bit like an American Idol stage with lights and smoke machines and fog and things like that. Uh, you may be wait, waiting for us to sing songs from Hillsong or Bethel. You may be waiting for the praise band to come out and lead us in a, in a triumphant chorus of oceans or something like that. And then you're going to be surprised when we sing songs, the words of which seem vaguely familiar to you, but you've never heard that song before. Well, <laughs> probably what we're doing is singing the Psalms. That's right. Presbyterians have a long tradition of actually singing the biblical song, Psalms put to meter. And we believe that's imminently biblical and faithful to do so. Uh, because the Bible actually tells us to sing the Psalms. And we are kind of surprised that many churches don't sing the Psalms, whereas it's expressly commanded to do so. So Ephesians 5.19, Colossians 3.16, uh, even the Psalms themselves tell us to sing the Psalms. And so if you come into a Presbyterian church, maybe you've heard uh, a tune from a different hymn, but the words seem strangely biblical, it may in fact be that we're singing the Bible back to God. In fact, we have a large place for the Psalms in our holy worship. And so just go ahead and look down at the hymnal, maybe in the bottom corner, it may even tell you which Psalm we happen to be singing on that day. We think it's a beautiful thing. Some people think it's weird, but we think it's wonderful. I will tell you this, there are two kinds of Presbyterians. Those are, there are exclusive psalm singing churches. Those would be those that only sing the psalms. And there would be inclusive psalm singing churches where they, we sing, like our church, we sing psalms, hymns, and uh, some, uh, some praise courses before the worship service formally begins. All right. Fourth, we have a pretty strong view of the Lord's Day. We are actually Sabbatarian people. Here's another one of those Ten Commandments coming back uh, into the four here. So uh, the commandment on the Lord's Day, or the fourth commandment, tells us to honor one day in seven as a day set apart to, Lord, to the Lord. And so well, we do that. Uh, we have a pretty strong view of the Sabbath. And so if you come into a Presbyterian church and let's say you ask the pastor uh, to maybe go boating with you next Sunday or maybe to go to an NFL game after church or maybe even you ask a friend to skip church and go to an NFL game or something like that, uh, maybe golfing, possibly even going out to eat, you may find that Presbyterians are, are very politely declining these kinds of invitations uh, to do these things on the Lord's Day. And that's because we believe that the, <clears throat> excuse me, the whole of the day is to be set apart for the worship of God and resting and trusting in the goodness of his, of his promises. We have nothing against a good nap. We have nothing against a wonderful potluck lunch. Um, but we do tend to try to honor one day in seven as a day set apart to the Lord. 
And so if you find somebody very pol politely declining and you keep wondering why these Presbyterians will never go golfing or boating with you on the weekends, it might be because of our Sabbatarian position. Finally, uh, here's maybe a big one for you. We do preach and teach the doctrines of predestination. Okay, this may be utterly unfamiliar to you, but predestination comes right out of the Bible. In fact, I challenge you to look up some of these passages. Look up Ephesians 1. There's a very strong, very beautiful, comforting passage related to predestination there. So also in the book of Romans and chapter 8 and in chapter 9. And uh, yes, we certainly preach that people should repent of their sins and be saved, but we also emphasize that God has been working in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives even before we come to that moment of decision. In fact, we'd go so far as to say that the human will is unable to decide for God until God, first of all, works to soften and to change the heart. And so of all things being considered, it's probably true that we emphasize divine grace more than we emphasize human decision. Although, again, we do preach and believe that people need to repent of their sins, trust in Christ, and receive him as Lord and Savior. The Bible talks a lot about the elect or election. In fact, Jesus himself talks, ta Jesus himself talks about the elect. It's amazing if you begin to look it up in the scriptures um, that you will see the terms predestination, uh, uh, to elect, the chosen, all these sorts of things are fairly common language in the Gospels and especially in the epistles if we, uh, if we take them seriously. So those are five things that may surprise you about Presbyterian churches. Let me leave you with this. If all of this is new to you, um, you can read our full beliefs. It's in a document called the Westminster Confession of Faith. This is, our, uh, this is our belief system in 33 chapters with scriptural proofs. I'll post a link to this book in the description of this video. I also have a pretty easy introduction to the Westminster Confession. I don't have it on my desk right now, but it's called Hold Fast the Faith. Um, and it's, it's a devotional that works through the Westminster Confession of Faith. So if you're interested, I'll post a link to that as well. All right. Well, thanks for checking in to this video. Uh, I do love you lots and hopefully we'll see you in a Presbyterian church. Uh, church. Check you later. Thanks.